everything will come. Uh, so welcome back to this much announced and much anticipated session on how it's on research methodologies for studying international courts, international lawfare, uh, particularly in the context of sexual and reproductive rights. But it is also, since it's methodologically focused, it's also applicable to other forms of international law. And this, uh, this session will be, uh, or the keynote rather, will be followed by a panel discussion. But first, the keynote will be given by Malcolm Langford, who is a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Oslo, and who used to be uh, the deputy director of Law Transform for many, many years and very central to the idea of the burning exchanges and law transform, and where who has been away in Australia for a year, and we're super, super happy to have you back and to have you here and to learn from you. So please, Malcolm. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Siri, and it's wonderful to be back in Bergen and in uh, Norway and to see so many old faces, uh, familiar welcome faces, but also lots of new faces and new ideas and new discussions. And uh, it's a privilege to always, as always, to be here. So in life, we often look at what is in the foreground, what is directly in front of us, the building rather than the surrounds or nature, or it's a particular person rather than the people who surround us, or it's a particular thought or emotion that constantly captures our attention rather than all the things we could or should be thinking about, or just silence. And I can bet for many of us that thought is often negative self-talk or worry or stress. All the thing in front of us might be our mobile phone and some part of the virtual world rather than the unfolding terrestrial world uh, around us. We humans have a preference for the foreground rather than the background. I want you to look at this painting. Hands up those who have never seen this painting before. So you're my first sample. What is your first impression when you see this painting? What do you see? Police? Women? Anything more? White people? Nice dresses? Hairband? Hats? Green? Aristocracy? Okay. You've seen a lot now. Hands up those who know or have seen this painting before. What do you see? Hmm? Yeah. And they're prostitutes. Yeah. And what does the sign say in the door? Police doctor. Yeah. So our first impressions, it's almost universal when you show this painting. It's Well, it looks like 19th century, maybe aristocracy, nice dresses. And then you start a little bit further and it's like, well, there's a police officer. So why would there be a police officer at an aristocratic event? And there's, there's a sign there. Not everybody looks so happy that someone turned away. So you start to get a bit confused. And then if you have that additional piece of information, you happen to know the language, you can read the sign. It says police doctor. Uh, why would women be seeing a police doctor? And then you start to work out maybe these are sex workers or prostitutes, as some call them. And so to understand what is going on, just in a seemingly simple painting like this, there are layers and layers that often need to be uh, understood. When we take a phenomenon, not a painting, but a phenomenon like lawfare, uh, and this is how Siri often defines it, 
uh, and defines it in our forthcoming book. The strategic and iterative use of rights, law and litigation to advance or halt contested policy reform and social change. Well, how do we study and understand that? Um, and if you draw on complexity theory or a range of complexity theories, we can understand a complex phenomenon as having basically three vectors or determined by three things. One is space. There are lots of elements there, quantitatively and qualitatively, lots of things. Time, it is changing. It is dynamic. Uh, it's not fixed uh, uh, where you can actually get the magnifying glass and take a look. And thirdly, there are lots of relations between things, such that there are a, a deep network behind everything, but it's, things are also interdependent. If one thing changes here, that will affect this thing uh, over here. That will tell you what a complex problem is in psychology, a complex adaptive system in environment, economics, traffic, uh, and so forth. But it also helps us understand phenomenon which we are trying to, to study. And we may have many questions uh, about it temporarily. When did things happen? Prescriptively, what, how, and where? Uh, questions of causation, why, or normative questions. Uh, you know, why should this be occurring or not? So lawfare is not an easy thing uh, uh, to study. And that's not easy even if you begin at the national level. So take, you know, the most famous climate change case recently uh, in the Netherlands, uh, which is, you know, uh, representing the second wave of, of litigation uh, around the world, where the Dutch courts basically found the Netherlands' target of 20% uh, reductions by 2020 of carbon emissions was unconstitutional. If you want to start, and or in, in Norway, where they didn't find, find an oil exploration license unconstitutional on climate change grounds. Lots of different actors, lots of different courts uh, over time. But if you wanted to start studying climate change lawfare as a phenomenon, then you've got around 2,200 cases across the world in 51 jurisdictions. Uh, still the majority of US, but that's across 50 state jurisdictions uh, and one federal uh, jurisdiction and many different uh, uh, courts. If we go to the international level and you know the explosion of international courts that we've seen across the world, it's also uh, quite tricky. So one of the things that we've been studying is international uh, investment arbitration, um, where there's three and a half thousand investment treaties uh, between states across the world. And now um, 1,257 investment arbitration cases, all are ad hoc with often three member uh, panels, which allow an investor to, a, to sue a state for expropriation. Or in the case of Philip Morris, regulating how uh, cigarettes are packaged and advertised. Um, and has created a lot of uh, uh, controversy. Studying this universe is rather uh, challenging, um, but we've tried with different methods. For example, we've identified out of the 600 arbitrators, the 25 most powerful uh, on, on different uh, indicators. We've also analyzed the entire community of lawyers and tribunal secretaries around 5,000 and all of their connections using, for example, computational network analysis trying to get an understanding of both the background and then who is really uh, uh, in the foreground. And it's not just necessarily those who have lots of cases, but those who are also appearing in cases and having double roles. Uh, and we're able to show with a combination of methods who was most powerful. But one of the things that perhaps is even more difficult from a sort of uh, a phenomenon perspective is what happens after. We recently got a research council project to look at compliance. Everyone presumes in this regime that states pay up because the system is very strong on enforcement. Investors are often powerful, the most are often multinational enterprises. So we assembled a team, and this is where it gets tricky with international lawfare, to find out what happens, but we needed different languages. So we got 25 researchers with around 17 different languages to start trying to dig in the different countries what actually happened afterwards. And um, firstly, from just all the public documentation, it seems actually only half the cases are actually complied with, just like in every other area of international uh, law. So confounding the, the, the presumption, but we've had to keep on digging and we're now doing qualitative research, interviewing many of the state actors as to why they don't comply. Is it ideological? They don't have the money? Is it strategic? They do deals uh, and so forth. But trying to understand fully this phenomenon, 
uh, from how it begins, what happens in arbitration, and how it ends up on the ground. And here is a diagram that tries to capture this in true Siri Gloppen uh, style. Uh, only Siri could come up with it, but it shows precisely all the different elements are uh, here. Yes, we can look at the international court in the middle and lawyers, we lawyers like to do that, but there's so much going on at the country level, international uh, government organizations, transnational activist uh, networks. Um, you've got a whole dynamism of what is happening uh, from the instigation of the dispute and the case through to enforcement and then has dynamic feedback uh, effects. But the problem is, is that when we look at something, we often come with an existing perspective. And as researchers, we often come with our existing methods, which we've learned in our bachelor or masters or wherever. And, you know, if we've been given a hammer, we then tend to see everything as a nail, when in fact it might require something else. And studying lawfare is a prime example of something that requires a more pluralistic perspective. Uh, and also a pluralistic approach to methods. Um, and as Rand Herschel uh, wrote recently, <clears throat> one of the perplexing oddities of contemporary constitutional studies continues to be the disciplinary divide and consequent lack of communication between the legal scholarship on constitutional law, and you could add any, any, add any other area of law, arguably the most political branch of law, public or private, and social science scholarship on constitutional history, development, and politics. And we still see paradigm wars going on in journals between quantitative and qualitative methods, legal and non-legal methods, uh, you name it. So when we look <laughs> at lawfare, we have to be wary of falling to the trap of just first impressions or our existing perspectives. So I'm going to move on to talk about a, a project that we've had over many years or too many years, uh, which is finally coming to fruition uh, in a forthcoming book at the Cambridge University Press with quite a number of contributors uh, are here, uh, looking at international sexual and reproductive rights uh, lawfare, uh, including the, the famous uh, Dudgeon case uh, in 1981 on decriminalization of homosexuality through to the Sierra Leone um, uh, uh, Criminal Court uh, also, which has been looking at reproductive rights cases, inter-American cases, uh, uh, UN human rights body cases, and so forth. And as part of that, we've coded uh, or sought to code every single case in international courts on sexual and reproductive rights uh, uh, lawfare. And Anna's going to talk a bit about that. Uh, uh, Anna's going to talk a bit about the process. Um, but you can see the dramatic rise from the early uh, 1980s. But interesting, the first case is taken already in 1955. Uh, in fact, there's almost no scholarship on that first 20 years, but particularly cases from Germany on decriminalization of homosexuality start off very early and were all, re all rejected. The red line is the conservative cases. We've been talking about conscientious objection uh, in the field of abortion rights. Uh, there's quite a number in, in that field there amongst some, amongst some others. In terms of the categories, um, quite a lot on LGBTQI cases, a significant number on abortion, but also other reproductive themes uh, around pregnancy, sterilization, and so forth. Sexual violence cases have really uh, increased uh, in, in recent years quite dramatically, and there's a range of other uh, themes. Um, there's a jurisdictional asymmetry though, um, which just often happens when you're studying comparatively or internationally. European Court of Human Rights has, you know, a huge number of, of, of the cases, both all cases filed or cases with final res, res, uh, uh, resolution. Uh, also earlier, the uh, European Commission of right, Human Rights, uh, the ECOMHR. But the inter-American system has been really now exploding with cases. And just recently, the number of non-European Court of Human Rights cases uh, has trumped annually the number of uh, European Court of Human Rights cases. But we also see some of the UN human rights bodies there, CEDAW, Human Rights Committee, Torch Committee, European Court of Justice uh, as well. Uh, we've also seen a major change in the success rate early on, as I mentioned, very few successes, but it starts to reach around 50% by the late 90s and even jumping up higher uh, in the last uh, decade. So it looks promising, but how promising uh, we'll get back to. But first impressions show at least 
uh, on, on the average, an average claim is being quite successful. And so the book that we have that seeks to analyze this, um, you can see the contents uh, page there, and we have Rachel here, Alicia, Anna, uh, uh, amongst others who have written different chapters. Um, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be showing some more statistics from the Rise of International Litigation chapter, chapter two. Uh, chapter three with Alicia is, is, is a brilliant look at the transnational actors behind many of these cases. And they study not just the progressive movement, but also the conservative movement. And if you look generally at socio-legal studies and studies of legal mobilization and lawfare, we as a community tend to study the progressives. Rarely the conservatives who are both opposing these cases, uh, but also bringing cases in, in, in different ways uh, with, with, with lawfare. And so in this book, we've tried to um, uh, look at both. And then that chapter does it nicely. We then look at the UN human rights bodies, um, and I'll come back to one of the impact studies there. But uh, Camilla and Lucia also have one on the, the impact in uh, um, Peru uh, on quite a number of cases around international reproductive justice, which we've also heard about. We look at some of the European courts, both at the regional level, but also what happens at the, Aust for example, in Austria, where you see a dynamic as they win more cases, they take more cases. Uh, but also a real divide between the lawyers and the social movements over how fast they should go and use in courts. Um, we have also the inter-American and African uh, systems. We have Adrian here, I think, as well, somewhere. He will come for the, for the, for, for the panel. Yeah. Um, and we also have a, a critical chapter, which I'll, I'll come back to. So how do we engage with this uh, uh, phenomenon? Another way of thinking it is uh, epistemologically is Aristotle's three forms of knowing, reason, revelation, and observation. Reason gets you somewhere, at least with theory and uh, normative approaches or logic. Revelation, well, that's, you know, what you uh, uh, is revealed hermeneutically from a text. You know, Moses comes down from the, the mountain, the parliament comes with legislation, the court comes with, with text. Um, 95% of legal education is devoted to that single form of epistemology, um, which makes it a challenge when you actually want to study uh, <laughs> the world, uh, when this form of epistemology tends to be rather helpful uh, observation, which lawyers don't learn much about at all uh, in social sciences. Social scientists do, but social scientists can have that middle category. Um, but even Aristotle in practice wasn't particularly good at the last form. Um, so he wrote, uh, males have more teeth than females in the case of men, sheep, goats, and swine. In the case of other animals, observations have not yet been made. Sounds very scientific. Uh, Bertrand Russell comes along a few thousand years later. Aristotle maintained that women have fewer teeth than men. Although he was twice married, it never occurred to him to verify this statement by examining his wives' mouths. So observations important but not always not always done but we also have an ontological term a recognition that the way in which we do our epistemology reason revelation and observation is influenced by the worlds that we live in and the standards by which we categorize knowledge and rank our, our knowledge and so we also have to be aware that we're very much influenced by where we stand in a society, a place uh, in the world. And, you know, this book is written, is edited by two people living in Norway, uh, in, in the global north who have particular backgrounds. We've tried to have a, a global reach, but we're particularly seeing, this already come out in the presentations this morning, the challenges of, of, of really knowing something uh, in a truly pluralistic and global sense. And we had the critique earlier around, for example, the, the white dominance in, in the reproductive justice movement uh, in the US. Indigenous perspectives have also become increasingly important. So what do we mean by observational methods, which are obviously going to be key for understanding empirical phenomena? Well, quantitatively, we've got coding and survey methods in terms of data gathering, descriptive statistics, regression analysis, experimental methods, and quantitative network analysis. And I'm going to give some of the examples here because some of the others in the panel have been very working along, like Rachel, for example, on more qualitative methods in her chapter on, on, on the Murillo case uh, on IVF uh, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We can think about qualitative methods like fieldwork and interviews, 
survey uh, methods focusing on text, process tracing, tracing sort of the queen of qualitative methods, uh, um, uh, following a process but setting up certain hypotheses that may allow you to say something quite powerful around uh, causation, case studies, qualitative comparative analysis, which is kind of medium analysis when you have a small set of numbers, how you might think through in a in a in a a logical sense of sufficient and necessary conditions around causation, even though you have a small data set. And narratology, understanding the different narratives in a particular context. We have also now the computational turn in law, in social science, using quantitative text analysis, machine learning, computational network analysis, agent modeling. Uh, I'm not gonna show so much of that uh, uh, today. You saw it a bit with the network analysis. Um, but we have, for example, we've got a recent paper where we predict uh, treaty outcomes in investment arbitration after building a model. Um, and we can basically predict the outcome in a treaty negotiation between Norway and Australia uh, with knowing the GDP differences and the institutional histories and preferences for drafting. So, and this method we see increasingly also in social legal studies. But humanistic methods, methods using revelation, revelatory forms of epistemology can also be important. Legal doctrinal methods and understanding courts, historical source criticism. We also have a historical turn in international law, but also socio-legal studies, but also critical text analysis coming from more post-structuralist and, and sort of uh, legal Marxist approaches. And one of our chapters does a more critical feminist uh, review of, for example, criminal prosecution in international courts on, on, on reproductive rights and the way it often narrows uh, the focus on reproductive justice rather than, than broadens it. But given the complexity of this phenomena, we might also want to mix methods. And so in an edited book, you can have different uh, methods going on and you kind of mix them in the introduction and the conclusion. But one might also want to mix them in, in specific studies. And we have some chapters uh, that do that. I have a new chapter that's just out on mixed methods uh, uh, in, in human rights, which you can uh, look at online. But very briefly, what do we mean by this? Well, it can be any method, at least in my view, but it has to be the mixing of at least two. When can it occur? At the data gathering stage data analysis or some crossover, for example, a qualitative data gathering with a quantitative analysis. Why? You don't always need mixed methods. You know, if you have a closed research question, which directs you towards a particular method, go for it. Uh, but if you have an open research question, like many of the questions we have, it may be very appropriate. Or we have evidential ambiguity. We've got one method which we think works, but we want to confirm it and test it. Uh, you know, a quant method with a previous quality method. Or compensate. We know this method won't really help, but we want to compensate with another method. And how? There's basically uh, three broad approaches. Sequential, where you take different methods in turn. Concurrent, you do them at the beginning. Oh, you do them at the same time. Or crossover, you're moving between. Or computational, which actually combines both quantitative and qualitative methods uh, together. We can come back to that more in question time if you're interested. So let's just take three examples from the book, um, which have elements of these methods. And there's a bit of a quantitative bias uh, here. So first, uh, one of the most famous um, uh, sexual and reproductive rights cases internationally, the Tunin case in 1994, because um, same-sex relations were criminalized in Tasmania. Uh, uh, Australia lost the case uh, in, in the Human Rights uh, Committee. Um, but we wanted to find out, you know, it gets a lot of attention as a landmark case, but what actually happened. And so we did process tracing on, in Australia to try and see the, the reverberations of the effects of this decision, just beyond the fact that uh, uh, same-sex relations were just, uh, decriminalized in Tasmania legally. And we could find effects going all the way up to the same-sex marriage referendum and the way it impact, for example, social mobilization and the LGBT uh, movement, which started having a tan Tasmanian increasingly base uh, as uh, due to this, this work. But we were a bit skeptical about the significant results we got from this case. Can we really say that in most cases it goes to the Human Rights Committee or UN Committee would get this sort of impact? So we looked at 27 other cases where Australia had lost uh, and found that no. <laughs> uh, on our, it varies dramatically the types of impacts and compliance rates we get uh, uh, for a case against Australia. We also looked at the impact um, 
uh, on states reporting to the UN Human Rights Committee? Did they start reporting more on LGBT issues after this decision that they'd made? Uh, the committee had made? No, didn't have much impact there. It didn't even impact the Human Rights Committee itself in what the questions it had asked. It actually took an LGBT member who was openly gay <laughs> to actually start that process. So we saw varying impacts of this uh, decision uh, in different spheres. Uh, another thing we've looked at in the book is judicial behavior. And you might have remember that I said there's been a massive increase in success. But as, as Larry Helfer and Claire Ryan show in their chapter on LGBT rights in European courts, most of those successes are on rights contracting cases. Okay, where a state seeks to restrict something that's pretty much already accepted across Europe. When it's rights expanding, okay, same-sex marriage, European Court of Human Rights, you know, has not said that that's a right. I mean, many other courts have, you know, Canada, US, uh, Colombia, you name it. So they've been quite cautious on rights uh, expanding. And we found the same when we looked at uh, um, um, sexual violence and reproductive rights, that on rights expanding uh, uh, decisions, you rarely get full, full uh, success. Abortion rights, for example, uh, there's no right to abortion to, uh, on demand uh, with the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but rights contracting cases, the court is very strict. Um, we also look, for example, at the effects of having amicus, because we an amicus brief. So we saw a massive increase in, in third party uh, in, intervention uh, in these cases over time. Does it have an effect? Not so much, it turns out, um, particularly when the amici are supporting the applicant. But when they're un unknown direction, it seems to have more effect. So it seem they seem to be more uh, uh, viewed as perhaps as uh, objective. Uh, but when there's amici that come in to support the uh, respondent, the government, it tends to go worse for the government. <laughs> uh, so it's also perhaps an interesting sign. But what we found, though, is that the amici tend to be much more effective in the rights contracting cases. Also, it's interesting, inter-American court, you're more, much more likely to win than the European court. And that's so that a lot of the action now has shifted from Europe uh, to the Americas. Uh, on compliance, uh, we also found uh, varying rates. We built up from a qualitative study into a quantitative uh, study in some of the chapters. Um, and there's real issues of compliance, particularly in the Eastern European states, and particularly on rights expanding uh, cases rather than rights contracting. Also did some work very briefly on impacts of um, on public opinion. For example, in Norway, if you know that the European Court of Human Rights might strike down criminalization of sex purchase uh, legislation, would you change your opinion? 65% of Norway, su Norwegians support the so-called Nordic model, which criminalizes sex purchase. It's been struck down in a case in Canada on the grounds that it violates sex workers' rights in terms of uh, making uh, sex work less safe. Uh, we haven't actually seen a major reduction in the in 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 the market for sex work uh, in Norway, despite the criminalisation, and we see some uh, change in people's views once they hear about the potential for international courts decisions. This has high internal validity, but not necessarily external validity in practice, which we could talk about. So briefly, to conclude, what are the limitations on going big? Okay, so yeah, complex phenomenon. We need lots of methods. We need lots of perspectives. So firstly, commensurability. How do we make quantitative methods talk to qualitative methods? How do we make legal methods talk to non-legal methods? Sometimes you can put them into some the same language. And there's a great article on triangulation, uh, in, um, on work on, um, on tribal uh, chiefs' tribal powers uh, in uh, Uganda, trying to do this, putting quantitative and qualitative work in the same, on the same scale so you can actually uh, compare the evidence. In practice, though, you've just got to work hard and try and come up with some sort of pragmatic way of bridging these two ontologies of quant and qual, legal and non-legal, or just give up and just present the evidence and let the reader decide. Um, the other major challenge is practical. Can you learn new tricks in terms of new methods, the ethical sort of standards you need to go through? Um, can you overcome your own imposter syndrome at trying something uh, new? Uh, I often go through a process of ritual self-humiliation. Uh, you know, I just try it, I present it, I get hammered and critiqued, but, you know, I learn and then, you know, uh, we go on from there. Or partner up. Um, 
and work with others who have the skills. And you know, many of the projects have come out of the Bergen Exchanges uh, and Law Transform uh, put together people with different uh, skill sets. And the conclusion, well, on the method side, um, you know, methods are basically like a candy shop. It's lots you can choose from. Um, it's fantastic. It's fun. But you know, if you eat too much candy, uh, you start to get sick after a while. So there's only there's often a limit. So at some point, you need to pick your poison. Um, and what did we find with using these the, the, these different uh, uh, methods? I mean, our, our four key questions were around the causes of international sexual reproductive rights warfare, how the system is functioning, what are the effects, what is the normative legitimacy, and sort of what's driving this phenomenon. We found very modest evidence of US replication and export, which has been one of the critiques. There's evidence of both strategic case taking, but also legal consciousness that like you just have to go to courts. That's how you solve problem. That seemed to be driving some of the cases. Transnational networks are key on both the uh, liberal and conservative sides, same actors popping up. So on the Catholic organizations, but also, you know, uh, particular reproductive rights organizations across the world. But also conservative gatekeeping by some lawyers. Where we, we also looked at silent cases. Why don't certain African countries, certain Latin American countries have any cases? There's clearly violations. There's clearly a legal opportunity structure. They could clearly win. Is it because they're afraid it'll have no impact? There'll be backlash? Or is it because some lawyers are saying we don't do those sort of cases? It's 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 and we found some evidence of that. Functioning international courts were surprisingly more cautious on rights expanding issues. And so the European Court of Human Rights, for example, is not the great savior in, in this area, as it, as some view it, or the great activist, uh, as the governments often deride it. Um, is it strategic behavior ideology that's driving when there is decisions or non-decisions? Uh, it seems to be a mix of both. Mixed impacts in terms of changes on the ground, some material and political effects, varied backlash. A normal legitimacy was well, clearly some activist or dynamic interpretation going on, but it's much more cautious. So it's very much a middling picture of what we see of this phenomenon. It doesn't confirm the great critics or the great optimists uh, around international sexual and reproductive rights warfare. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malcolm. And you were on the second. This was really well timed. Uh, wonderful. So we'll now have a panel. Uh, uh, we need a couple of more chairs. So could you just please all come up and take your seats? Um, Adrian, Rachel, and Rachel and Anna. This is, I think this is the first time I have two Rachels on the panel. <laughs> and I think last time was probably the first time in a very Last time, yesterday we had two executives. That's also very <laughs> uncommon. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for setting us up in such an amazing way and uh, instead of drawing up the big candy shop of, uh, of possibilities. And I think we're living at a time where, where we, there is much more awareness in a lot of different fields of the possibility of exploring uh, issues in a much more multifaceted way. And but I wanted, before we go back to the methods, I wanted actually to ask um, Adrian Duco from the Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum in Uganda to give us the perspective from someone who has actually litigated and is actually, as we speak, litigating a case before a regional court in, in Africa. And this, uh, you can also sort of maybe say something about the domestic background and sort of how you see this uh, opportunity structure as in practical terms. Um, thank you so much, Siri. Um, thank you so much, Malcolm, for that analysis of uh, what goes on with international courts and the methodology that we can use to study them. Um, I'm a scholar in a way of international courts, but also, like Siri says, a practitioner, someone who uses the courts a bit money from that perspective. That's why I will share. 
So we are currently having a struggle back home in Uganda with the Anti-Homosexuality Act. Many of you must have heard about it, which is a law that essentially bans even discussion and conversations around LGBT rights are calling that promotion of homosexuality and uh, imposing a prison sentence of 20 years for what they call promotion of homosexuality. So that has a chilling effect on what we do in that country. So recently, the World Bank froze, um, froze lending to Uganda, and that is having some repercussions in terms of how that is being discussed in the country. So from the legal front, one of the things we decided to do is to take the matter to court. That is the Constitutional Court of Uganda. And we ended up having three different petitions that were filed challenging the law in the country. They're still going on. We've tried to prompt the court with the applications, the case of agency applications, uh, telling them that things uh, we want to hear this quickly, telling them that, you know what, we have violations, applications for uh, interim orders, and the court is not yet to budge. So we don't have a hearing date yet. We don't know when this case, case will be had at all, if at all, um, anytime soon in Uganda. Meanwhile, violence has doubled, not doubled, I think tripled or so if you look at the, if you look at last year, for example, we always had violence, like uh, six cases um, in a month or something like that. We're now dealing with over 70 cases of violence in a month. That shows you how much there's been a big leap in terms of violence. So I think the courts, please make the decision quickly because people are dying. People are being beaten. People are being arrested. Yeah. People are being violated. That's not happening. So one of the things that we looked at is the, again, the legal computer structure. What can we do in terms of the available options? So we have a number of options available to us at the international level. That is, we have the East African Court of Justice. We have the African Court, which we don't have because uh, we don't allow for cases as Ugandans. We have the African Commission on Human Rights, Rights, which eventually may go to the African Court. We have the UN Human Rights Committee, which we can go to. But we decided to take our case to the East African Court of Justice because of its interesting framework. Um, first of all, the East African Court of Justice uh, only allows a reference, an application to it within 60 days of the passing of the law. So you don't have to exhaust local remedies. When the law passes, you have 60 days within which to apply to the court. So we are, time was a real factor, so we had to apply within 60 days. We took the decision to do so after several reminded me <laughs> about after, after about a month. And then we had about two weeks to within which to file uh, the case before the South African Court of Justice, which we did. But for me, what, what we're expecting from there, and one of the things we're discussing uh, during our conversations is, how do you bring a case that doesn't put the court itself at risk and doesn't also spoil things for the whole East African region? That's a real calculation, that you want to go and ask court to nullify a law on homosexuality in Uganda. And this court has jurisdiction over the whole East African region of over seven countries. So including South Sudan, including Burundi, including Rwanda. So we, want to, we had to frame our discussion, conversation in such a way that it didn't really impact so much on the other countries. And so we are limiting our application to only procedural grounds. So we're not arguing human rights at all. We're not arguing even rule of law in that respect, except rule of law in the sense that the court, the act was passed without following due process. That is uh, that there was not enough public participation and that the speaker was biased in the way the matter was brought. So those are some of the calculations that how would you not spoil it for everyone? And at the same time, you make your point. Also, we have Kenyan applicants. So it's a Ugandan law, but we have Kenyan applicants and Ugandan applicants combined for the East African region. And we formed a coalition around the court so that we have more impact, but also for people to feel that this is an issue that affects not just Ugandans, but the whole East African region as a whole. So that's how we made the calculations. And let us hope the court in Uganda, in, in the, the East African region, makes a decision before the Ugandan court does. Last time, we found in both courts, and we got a court in the Ugandan, a great decision in the Ugandan courts before we got one in the South African Court of Justice. So the South African Court of Justice would all matter to be moot. Now we are expecting that this may delay at the court again, and then we have the court at the South African Court of Justice making a decision. So taking advantage of the um of the judicial structure that you have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian, uh, for giving us sort of the perspective of of from from the. From, from action on how on how these matters work, and as you said, in most cases you have to you have to exhaust all domestic options before you can take it to the international level, uh, which has its own dynamics. But this is a very particular particular case with the uh, Supreme Court. But Anna Anna Cortez from uh, the University of Cambria in in uh, Coimbra in, in Portugal, and also University of Bergen, and a law transformer and member of many projects you have as uh, as also you alluded to earlier and also uh, Mark mentioned you've been 
instrumental in, in making this uh, database. So could you sort of tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, sure. So at first, I would like to thank Malcolm once more for the opportunity to be part of this project. Two years ago, during Bergen Exchanges, he approached me. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges we had uh, with uh, the database was actually one of the reasons they needed me. They needed to access uh, decisions from well, the inter-American uh, context that were only available in Spanish. So the language barrier that he also mentioned during the lecture. Mm. Later, I helped with some decisions from the European context that were also only, only available in French. And uh, at first, uh, this what, what I'm going to say today is very based on my experience, uh, experience working with the database. I've been through some of our emails and the reports to try to give a better picture of how the process the process and the ups and downs were um i started uh, looking uh, at uh, a few decisions from the european court of, no, no sorry the inter-american court of human rights they had already identified and they knew that existed but were in spanish and i looked at them and i thought i don't think that's all from the inter-american system they were there were only a, a few at this point, but um, uh, besides the language barrier that we depend on the mechanisms the courts make available for us to access what they produce. And uh, it has become a little bit better, but at the time the mechanism that was made available by the Inter-American Court was quite limited. What I did at the time, was look at all of the decisions ever <laughs> issued by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and uh, identify those that um, were linked to sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, and then we ended up with quite a number. Um, and uh, I was like, brace yourselves. There is more from the Inter-American Commission. <laughs> And th th there are challenges, of course, also because there, there are different uh, systems, different uh, names, different mechanisms. How are we going to code everything together? What are we going to consider um, here and there? And then we found uh, we have found a, a lot from the Inter-American Commission as well. The, um, there are regional specificities, like issues that are more relevant or more prevalent in one region or the other. And um, of course, a lot of meetings we have about which cases are relevant. When are we stopping? Should this, this case specific go, uh, should it be on the database or not? And then we, we have had several group meetings deciding details and what to do and what not to do. And after that, I, I, I mean, I don't know what's the opinion of the other people on the group about me, because I think I kind of gave everybody more work to do in a way, <laughs> because I, my task was also kind of challenge the database. I don't think we have all here. And well, Livia, who has already worked with me on a database, she knows I do that. Yeah. I was like, we should use this keyword. The, the, the European Court has a very good uh, uh, search mechanism. So we should test it. Let's use this keyword. Let, let's explore. Let's see if we really have everything. And then we ended up with quite a few more cases. Um, yeah, the database uh, looks so much more extensive now than before I joined. And uh, part of the work was also updating the cases. Well, I joined two years ago, as I said, but you have been working on that for a long time. And uh, some of the cases were there, but um, where they have been going on 
for a long time, they were not uh, updating that were updated with regards to the uh, last uh, decisions or relevant uh, happening. So part of it was also, uh, it, it takes time to work on and, and uh, build something that big. It's an incredible uh, project, a fantastic, uh, I'm very proud to be part of it, but also it, it takes time. It takes a lot of work. Mm. And at the same time, because it takes time, you have to keep working on it all the mm -hmm. time to keep it updated. Um, and um, so I have to stop now, but I think this covers mm -hmm. uh, some of the most uh, um, challenging, challenging process. Yes, yeah. super, super useful, Anna. And I think that where you ended, this sort of, this idea of thinking a database, building a database is a good idea. It's very easy to think. And then I think very often they die. Uh, so particularly for this reason, often actually as part of the project, but also later. So uh, Rachel Jkowski from the University of Washington in Seattle, political scientist, you have built databases, you work on this, and you you are, you can also speak to these challenges and opportunities. Yes, Please. yes, no, um, I, I think this is interesting because, um, you know, Malcolm, I think that some of the points you raise, and, and as I reflected on what maybe I could contribute here, um, and after sort of listening to all of these conversations we've been having throughout the week, these are very complex processes, right, of judicialization of lawfare, and how do we go about um, systematically studying this, right? As you know, again, as the, as the political scientist, what does even systematic mean, right? And, and I think Malcolm, you've raised um, a variety of ways to um, uh, come in on these research questions and, and try to um, draw conclusions um, from them. So I've, I've put together, and I'm, I'm, we're just kind of, again, this updating issue is always the issue, right? Um, kind of finalizing our, our most recent version, a database on the European Court of Human Rights in which it's, it's over 20,000 cases. And each of these cases have been coded, not for the sort of, you know, it, it, it has the general descriptors of, of the violations and, and the, the provisions and the respondent states um, who are involved, but importantly, we've coded for all of the organizational and interest involvement or participation in each of these cases. And so um, that could come in the form of being an applicant. It could come in the form of um, serving as legal representation for the applicant. It could also come as a third party intervener, which I know we've talked about a little bit. And um, and so I, I want to just raise three points about trying to create those types of databases and, and, and some of the motivation behind it and, and kind of where do we, we go with that. And I think the first sort of, you know, in some ways value added or, or one aim we were really trying to get at was to create um, and enable studying broad patterns, right, so that you weren't just talking about a single area of law um, certainly the observation that human rights organizations are using the European Court of Human Rights is no, right? That almost assumed. And then as people, researchers started digging, you certainly could find evidence. But how about the 21 other types of organizations, mm -hmm. right? And so by looking exhaustively at all the cases over an over 60 year time period, you're able to see not only what types of groups actually are using or organizations using the court, and how that's changed over time. So those broad patterns are um, can be very powerful in, in understanding um, temporal change, understanding cross-national variation, understanding variation across different um, areas of law. Um, so some findings from that, uh, corporations are the second most active organization mm -hmm. before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, in the area of third-party interveners, Religious organizations no. are on the rise. And these are, again, as we've um, talked about, these are coming in as um, drawing in conservative values into a conversation almost in a backlash way in, in some of these cases. So that's one point I want to make. A second one, just quickly, is in these projects from the get-go, thinking about accessibility and shareability 
of that data yeah. that you're collecting, right? So it doesn't end with the project. Yeah. It doesn't just remain for you to use in your own publications. And so with this project, we really thought about um, and have uh, a website that we continue to update and are really going to be pushing out um, an online analysis tool. Um, so we worked with a research design firm to come up with um, a way in which this data and information could be accessible to students, to practitioners, and to the public mm -hmm. to be able to see some of these broad trends. So thinking about using data visualization in a way that's accessible. But at the same time, we also think about the production of scientific knowledge and contributing there. And so we make raw data available. So CSV files that have that raw data that could be used for statistical analysis and looking at these broad trends. So that's a second point, this accessibility and shareability. And finally, I just wanna say um, these broad, large sort of data projects often relegate very complex processes to single data points. Yeah. And I think the last point I want to make is, is empowering qualitative research. I, I think of myself as sort of a large end qualitative researcher. And by that, I mean taking those data points and enabling process tracing, being able to find out um, it's exactly what we've been tracing those in the transnational networks to find out who's actually behind those organizations. And that comes through interviews. That comes through case law analysis where you analyze is Amnesty International's arguments being adopted by the court in, you know, in this particular paragraph? And you start to see um, uh, that movement of ideas and in a dialogue with the court. And I, I think by that, you're taking those data points and being true to the real lives, the complex processes, um, the different perspectives that are actually behind those data points. And so I think um, those are sort of the three pain points I wanted to raise. And in doing so, I guess I'm hoping, and I think this, this becomes to me still a question I think we all should engage is, is some of those normative questions. Does, does this create um, greater, you know, as we see the court expanding this access, does that mean it's more accountable? Is how does this change what justice is? Um, but at least by identifying who's actually um, utilizing these, these legal processes, we get closer maybe to being able to answer those questions. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you actually have like a perfect segue. <laughs> in so, because, because that is exactly it. So the, the great thing about the database is of course the reach. And as you're saying, the, the drawback is in a way the poverty of each of what sort of the thinness of what you can say. So what about qualitative? Thank yes. you. I did wonder when I saw my name on this panel quite what I was doing on it. Um, <laughs> I told you I had to remind myself that I actually did contribute So bear with me because we actually this is a, the, the chapter in the book is a paper that I wrote with my colleague Julieta Lemaitre, who many of the people in the room will know, um, who's a lawyer and a sociologist. Um, and, and a judge. A scientist who teach anthropology, so we have a lot of disciplines going on in there. And as I always say to my students, like when you come up with wonderful research designs, like how much time and how much money do you actually have to do this? So we had a little bit of money and we had no time. <laughs> <laughs> so that probably explains some of the methodological choices too. But the paper, um, which we published um, in 2017, and if people are interested, I can give you the reference. What we were trying to do was look at law face or the contentious engagement of pro-choice and anti-choice choice lobbies on abortion um, at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, right? So our question was kind of what happens to social movement claims when they go to international courts? And there's kind of lots of literature, as we know, on the contentious engagement at national court level, but there's really not a hell of a lot looking at um, international courts. So how do we go about trying to answer that question? Well, we try and do it through a very detailed description of just one case. Um, so we took the Artavio Murillo versus Costa Rica case, um, which was decided by the court, um, which is actually a case about IVF um, and Costa Rica, but it had ongoing repercussions, a very important case um, for abortion rights 
because it was about the interpretation of the right to life in the general convention. Most people in the room will know much more about it than me. Um, but um, so how do we do that then? We, with the single case, um, we looked at the documentary sources. So um, we had we did a very, very close reading of the amicus curiae briefs. And there were 39 uh, briefs um, submitted by individuals and organizations. Um, obviously, we looked at the judgment. Um, we looked at some of the press around uh, the case um, and other secondary petitions. And then we did a um, um, snowball sample, um, which you will all know, which is basically going to talk to your friends. Um, <laughs> so we, we interviewed, in this case, eight lawyers who had participated at different stages. Um, either they wrote the briefs for some of the feminist organizations, or they were clerks in the Inter-American Court at the time the case was going through. Um, and that was one of the problems that we had and have with studying the dark side. It's like, we can't talk to them, right? Because they already know who we are. Um, and when we did actually the abortion rights um, in Latin America project, one of the researchers Argentine was working on El Salvador, um, but like the minute she start asking for interviews with the dark side, like masses of hits on, you know, all of her mm -hmm. um, academia yeah, yeah, pages yeah. and things of people kind of searching and finding out that basically he was with, with the Jedi and so was, they wouldn't talk to her. <laughs> um, um, so we did, we did, we, so your positionality obviously matters in terms of, you know, not just your production of data, but who you can actually get access to. It's a bit easier um, to study international um, court judgments because it just tends to be a lot more online, right? So it was the access to the materials um, was much easier than say working on some of the domestic cases where, you know, you're basically going around the NGOs that you you have access to and begging them for the case files so that you can, you can work on that. Um, and um, this reading that we tried to do of the briefs or that we did of the briefs was to try and map the networks. Um, because obviously this case, um, this case because a major case for feminist and conservative networks around um, reproductive rights, um, and particularly conservative transnational social movements operating out of the US. Um, and they were all of them extremely concerned about what the court was going to say about Article 4 of the convention. So we did a classification exercise on the 39 amicus briefs. Um, 16 of them were clearly conservative, 13 of them were clearly feminist briefs. Um, the conservative briefs defended Costa Rican government's banning of I IVF, um, generally arguing the right, right to life and life begins at conception and then there's the right to life. Uh, and the feminist briefs argued that the ban represented a disproportionate violation of women's and couples' rights, especially rights to health, but also rights to privacy and to have a family. And the remaining 10 briefs um, took issue with conservative claims about scientific evidence, um, which was super interesting, mm -hmm. especially the claims about the embryo as a person and that IVF was harmful to the health of the fetus and mm -hmm. women. Um, I don't have time to kind of go through where all of the briefs came from, um, but we do that exercise in, uh, in the chapter. Um, yeah, very interesting, kind of we tried to track the Catholic bioethics networks across borders and how some of the same arguments came up in the different amicus briefs. Um, and we found out, yeah, and we, would, we were also tracking law professors and kind of who had written these briefs and where those arguments um, were recurring from. So there's a kind of another there's another project to do on legal education. And, yeah, yeah, and so, yeah. there were, there, so there was lots of... Very interesting stuff. Anyway, I'm going to stop and say that our conclusion was that all of the actors moderated their claims when they went to the international yeah. field yeah. Um, um, because they respond to one each one to each other and to the language the languages of, and the, the way that the court frames and the languages, which is what you would expect. But we didn't expect some of the the networks, and it was terribly hard to map. Yeah. The networks we were, and especially mm -hmm. the law professors were kind of looking at yeah. where they were publishing and kind of 
yeah, anyway. That's, that's somebody... But it's also interesting because I don't always think that everyone knows that they're part of a network. Sorry? It's also interesting because I don't always think that people are conscious that they're part right. of a network. So you're also doing things, tracing things that are sort of not things that people actually think about. Uh, we, are, we have time for quite, quite a few questions, actually. So I'm going to start. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you for the panel was super interesting. I have a question for Malcolm about what exactly do you mean if you could say something more about the legal doctrinal method? Because you, you divided the methods into observational, observational and hermeneutic. I don't pronounce well the, the word, but but uh, if, if the legal doctrinal method, uh, what you do is to look at the judicial doctrine or legal doctrine, uh, then the doctrine is the object, right? Not the method. I mean, if, 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 if this is the case, then the method would be observational, qualitative, I would say. I don't know, this is my doubts. I only put the doubts on the table. If the method is indeed hermeneutical, I would say that then you are evaluating or participating in doing doctrine. You know, you are, you are a participant and not an external observant because you, and normally lawyers do participate and you study the law from the outside. So I don't understand what hermeneutic method means in this chart. Thank you. I have a question about access for, sorry, I have right. to, yeah, thank you. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you said about traditionality and difficulty getting access to, um, what was it you called them? The, the dark side. The dark side, yeah. <laughs> um, because this is something that I also um, found in my research. So I started with my case study in um, Western Tanzania, well, I was a master's student and I got great access because um, I'm completely non-threatening. I hadn't published anything. Um, and uh, yeah, there's good collaboration with my university and the university I was working with who were also working with all the consultants on, on the case. So everything fine and great. And then I published my book chapter on evictions um, and it had some publicity on blogs um, and so on. And then I went back on my PhD and the situation totally changed. Um, the NGO did not want to talk to me, but I still got into the field and I left them for the end. And then I had some issues at the end of my field work, which is another story. Um, uh, but um, my point is, could you not, um, if you have master students or assistants, can you use another person and the introduction is so important to hear how you approach people or maybe it's a little bit sneaky but then if they have another supervisor which supervisor is are you going to say is well because we ha we do have to position ourselves right so yeah I just thought I'd bring some of those those things up <laughs> Thank you, everyone, uh, for the interesting panel. Um, just a quick comment on the dark side, uh, Rachel's uh, point. Um, so when I was doing the PhD research, uh, I did try to reach out to the other side. Um, some of them were more willing, um, <clears throat> set up several meetings, which they always cancel. Um, and then they sort of sent me to the website as well as their own position paper per se. So I didn't get to talk to anybody, but I did reflect and indicated that in the PhD thesis itself. Um, for the other Rachel, as well as the others that work on the database, and this is more of a um, self-interested question, um, there is a bit of work which I'm providing technical support within the African context, where uh, we are trying to map out, uh, especially as it relates to women rights, gender equality cases, um, both with the, <clears throat> the um, African Commission, the court, the ECOWAS and the sub-regional one, so ECOWAS as well as the EAC. Um, but, well, obviously part of it is you know, we were saying at the international level, it's ideally easier. In Africa, it's a whole different case um, as well. So even access to those decisions are problematic, uh, but there is a mapping of who is engaged and where they get that sort of support. 
part of the question uh, that we are asking, especially of the database, is trying to trace the implementation of those decisions. I don't know whether you've engaged as you do the database in terms of how do you track implementation? I know, you know, within the last past uh, 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 bargain exchanges, we have a conversation about implementation impact and Malcolm has a whole book around that. Uh, but part of it is in terms of what does implementation mean and how do you reflect that sort of in the database? I know that might be a basic question, but it's a big question, methodological question uh, that we're struggling with uh, as well. And thank you again for the panel. Malcolm, I was, uh, thank you. This was an excellent panel. Uh, Malcolm, I was wondering, um, you know, uh, when you do this kind of project and you've done several with Siri and with people on this table, how do you ensure that uh, the different methods that you're using are consistent across the case studies? Uh, that's number one. And number two is, you know, sort of putting everything together over the last four days is like, are there limits to theorization? <laughs> good questions very good questions so now as so i'm going to let you have so there are six minutes left i'm actually going to let you get three okay. so three questions are very quick so very broadly if we just think about what lawyers do in research they actually cover reason revelation and observation i mean lawyers are constantly actually describing things this is a court this is the law the reason, you know, probabilistic re uh, reason, this is a good chance of this happening or sufficient necessary conditions, you know, we use that a lot and thing. But what lawyers often bring to research that's distinctive is the doctrinal method, which is hermeneutic in the sense it's trying to understand the meaning of this text. Um, so that's what I mean by that. And that's what many, almost, almost all legal research projects are based around. But in these sorts of projects, as, and as a, a leading example of those, it's really important in doing the observational work to have a lawyer because they actually know the domain and they're a domain expert. So the best projects often involve a very strict lawyer who spanks all the uh, social scientists for not looking properly, classifying properly, and, 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 and so forth. On the second question on, I mean, uh, coding, compliance, and impact. So very briefly on compliance, do it observationally not and uh, not uh, descript uh, descriptively. So what do you see happening before you come up with some sort of normative category as to this is compliant or not? Just map what actually happens because everyone has a different view under the sun as to what compliance means. And it's the same with impact. It goes even broader. I mean, uh, we can think about material impacts, changes in policy, uh, jurisprudence, legislation, political impacts, changes in power relationships, who, who is in the circle, symbolic impacts, changes in discourses, ideas, uh, and so forth. So map out different things to the extent that you can, but be aware that you, there's a next phase of when you actually start to work more analytically and say, we're going to define compliance as this impact for this purpose, uh, because it is just so complex. Um, but build from the bottom up with some sort of theoretical scaffolding and then sharpen up to that. Does theorization have, have, have its limits? Uh, yes, uh, uh, deeply. We actually don't know very much about any <laughs> theory, evidence. Let's be humble. I wouldn't say anything. Um, okay, quickly, I will just respond to... Um... And this is really funny that you said that, Malcolm, because I'm I'm I was about to say the same sort of thing with um in the question about implementation. Um and let me just reiterate because I think um and maybe I don't know if international courts in particular suffer from this or it's IR scholars in which um they quickly could just say, you know, is there good or bad compliance? And that was like, did you take to this judicial decision? is there a general measure or an individual measure that's been taken? Boom, you've complied. And that was sort of end of story. And that's such a thin way of understanding what implementation um, or even uh, effect is. And so, you know, I, I concur with this idea of making that more nuanced. And maybe I wanna push that even further to say, um, when you call a judicial decision success, when you call it constraining or um, so restrictive or whether it's expansive, be careful with all of those. 
because they're in relationship to who, mm -hmm. right? Because as we know, losses in courts, you know, I, I, is this a Michael McCannism? I don't know. You know, these losses in courts have radiating effects that can actually be successes for mm -hmm. movements in particular. So just be careful when you're thinking about that effect side um, to think about how you're how you're defining it um, and what you're observing. Um, yeah, just in response then to Emma's point, um, yes, um, it's important to think about multi-generational, multidisciplinary teams when you're trying to get access to different kind of actors. And actually, Anna Braconier will talk in another panel on the Women on the Bench project, which we did in Guatemala. And we had three of us, Anna, who's a political scientist, uh, me and then a younger lawyer from Guatemala doing the research and we actually interviewed together and it was super interesting just in terms of kind of access mm -hmm. and how the judges, the women judges reacted to, you know, the, to the team. So yes, you have to be creative, but also, you know, there are all sorts of ethical issues and about kind of embedding people with horrible organizations. Um, but I went on quite a lot of demonstrations in Mexico of all of these um, anti-choice people who gave me lots of balloons and asked me to put pictures of their demonstrations on my Facebook page, which I don't So, <laughs> so do some ethnography as well, even if you're not going to do the ethnography, if you can get access, it's good to just go. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been, I think, for all of us, really, really uh, super interesting. And sometimes you can just hear the audience being super attentive. <laughs> and and I mean that's happening a lot uh, during these days, but I could also hear that now. So I think this was really useful to have all of these different perspectives. So thank you very much. I want to just remind you that after lunch, we now are an hour for lunch, uh, which is upstairs in the in where we had where some of you were on Tuesday for a party, but you can walk up the stairs to take the elevator. But afterwards. We will, uh, we will go to a, to a completely different topic, talking about uh, criminal insanity, how that is constructed in different, in different countries and in different ways. And I think it's going to be super interesting. There will be a keynote by Linda Gerning, who's a professor here, and then, and then a roundtable with people from across the globe. So it's going to be really interesting. So I welcome you back, and I thank you for now. And then we'll go come to the cups. <laughs> you all have so many cups. <laughs> but